So today's message is titled, uh, Waiting for the Promise, Waiting for the Promise. Today's the first Sunday of Advent season, and as Andrew led us today, Advent comes from the Latin, Adventus, and it is a threefold way in which we anticipate the coming of the Lord. The first way, of course, you know, is Christmas, right? It is Jesus' first coming. And throughout these next four weeks, we're going to be celebrating the coming of Jesus 2,000 years ago uh, in the form of a baby in a manger, a God who, according to the word, although he was fully God, he did not count equality with God something to be grasped, and he emptied himself, took on the form of a servant, and he was born into this world. So this is what we're celebrating, you know, first off, uh, when we think about Advent. Now, the second way in which we celebrate is the way in which he has already come into our present lives. It's celebrating Jesus' coming into our hearts. So he is the one who has truly broken the chains of sin and death and shame over our lives, and he has pulled us out of the miry clay through the sacrifice on the cross. That is the second way in which we celebrate Advent season. And the third way in which we look forward to Jesus' coming is we anticipate and we await his second coming. The Bible talks about one day when every eye will see Jesus returning. The same way that he ascended, he will once again descend. And on that day, those who have put their trust in him and who have waited for him with lamps filled with oil, they will behold the one that they've been waiting for. And so Advent season, in a nutshell, it is a season of waiting. It's a season of waiting. Now, here's the problem. We suck at waiting. We're very bad at waiting. So during the month of uh, October, I don't know if you guys remember, many of us, you know, we're fasting in different ways. One of the things that I fasted was social media, and I forgot how addicted I was to my phone. Because what do you do when you're waiting for the train to come? You get on your phone. What do you do when your friend is 15 minutes late to the restaurant? You get on your phone. What do you do when, I don't know, you're in the waiting room, you know, at a clinic, and although clinics are super fast here in Korea, you still have a few minutes to wait, right? You get on your phone. Every spare moment you have, you get on your phone. And for me, it was like, like eye-opening, like, wow, I don't know what to do with myself when, I'm, when I don't, like, bring out my phone. Go right over to whether it be email or Instagram or, you know, I, I am like very old school and so I can only handle a couple of platforms at a time. But for you young folks who can multitask, there's like what? There's like Snapchat and there's like TikTok and there's like all these other things that I will never ever understand and that's okay. But there's like YouTube, email, cacao, podcasts, ebooks, all these different things that we have right at our fingertips. And I forgot just how much I you know, I need this phone at all times, and I actually don't know how to wait. I actually don't know how to wait. Like, if you're waiting outside the subway station for your friend to come out, and they're a few minutes late, and imagine, okay, you're just going to leave your phone in your pocket. What do you do? What do you do? You just stand there? <laughs> you know, I, I saw this, um, this post, you know, um, um, and it, it says, I saw a guy at Starbucks today, no iPhone, no tablet, no laptop, he just sat there drinking coffee like a psychopath. <laughs> it is like that rare, like you just don't know how to be fully present. And I think that's kind of our reality. Like what do you do without your phone? What do you do without constant distraction? And I think for me in October, I realized, man, it's not that I'm patient, I'm just very, I'm able to distract myself in the waiting, but I actually have lost the ability to know how to wait. And so, you know, just for a brief moment, we're going to show a really quick video. I've shown this video before. It was a few years ago, but it'll just give us a, a snippet. You know, it'll give us, a, you know, a glimpse into, you know, what it looks like to wait. And so could we actually hit blackout lights as well on the switchboard? Yeah. All right. Okay, sit in that chair. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you another one, so then you'll have two. 
But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? okay. All right. I'm gonna go do something and then I'll come back. It smells yummy. So it's up to you. You can have it now or you can wait. Okay? I'll be back. Stay in the chair, okay? Okay. So I'm gonna leave and then I'll come back, okay? So you can either eat it right now or you can wait. Either way, okay? Okay. How'd you do? Did you do good? You did? Yeah. You wanted to eat it, didn't you? Yeah. So did I tell you I'd give you another one? Okay, now you can have both. You need them. <laughs> this is an actual experiment that they did with kids at this church. I think it's kind of cruel, but this is, you know, this is what it actually looks like, you know, when we are told to wait, to actually exercise patience, to, you know, look forward to, you know, not... De uh, not immediate gratification, but delayed gratification. And if it's about waiting for an extra marshmallow, you know, the stakes are pretty low. We'll live. Like, we'll live without that second. Actually, we'll live longer without that second marshmallow, right? So it's not, it's not a huge deal. But so I don't want us to focus on the marshmallow itself. I want us to focus on this aspect of waiting. What if it's not a little snack that you're waiting for, but something much bigger? You know, something that will affect your life, something that might define your future, something that might alter the course of history, something that might affect everything and everyone you know. What if it's something on the caliber of a promise of God? And so today, as we start off the season of Advent, the season of waiting for his coming, we will focus on two people who waited for the promise of God to come. So we're going to be focusing on Simeon and Anna. Now, we know very little about these two characters from the text. Simeon, he was an old man. He was advanced in years. He served in the temple, and he had received the prophetic promise that from God that he would see with his own eyes the consolation of Israel, the Lord's Christ. And it's unknown when he received, you know, this promise from God. It could have been the pre previous week, it could have been decades before that, right? It could have been, you know, who knows? But by this point, he was an old man. Maybe he, you know, his hands were a bit shaky. Maybe his eyes were a little bit dim. Maybe his steps a little bit shuffly. Like this, this was the point in his life that he was at. And similarly with Anna, she was an 84-year-old widow. 
The text tells us that she had been married for seven years. So imagine she got married at 13. They used to get married pretty early, right? Imagine she got married at 13. She was married for seven years, so until 20, and she became a widow at 20. She lost her husband at 20. And then from the age 20 until 84, for 64 years, she was in the temple day and night, fasting, praying, worshiping, awaiting the coming of Jesus. Now, I don't know what kind of steel resolve you need to be able to do that for 64 years because I get tired after 20 minutes. You know, and without my phone, probably like 30 seconds, right? My heart is so fickle, so full of conviction one moment, and then, you know, it kind of fizzles out the next moment. I'm in full-on despair. I get quickly discouraged. I get very easily dissuaded. You know, I, I am seldom resolute. I'm very often shaken. So if, you know, all of us, we, we understand, like, I, I don't know how anybody would do that without actually seeing something, seeing a sign here and there, without being thrown a bone here and there for 64 years. I absolutely do not understand how that can happen. And I know that about myself. I'm very, very weak when it comes to that. And every year I get reminded of that. When does that happen? At the beginning of the year. New Year's resolutions. It never lasts more than two weeks for me. And so I am very, very aware of my weakness, my inability to follow through, my, my inability to push through resistance, my inability to kind of keep pressing on, keep going on, to not look around and, oh, man, I'm the only one who's still keeping my New Year's resolutions. Uh, maybe like, you know, and I will kind of base it off how other people are doing. If I'm doing better than other people, oh, okay, I'm, I'm a little bit better. I feel a little bit better about myself. I'm doing worse, like, man, oh, man, I'm a failure. And it's like so easy to to base yourself on that, but if you had none of that, if you have none of that, could you wait for a promise from God for 64 years, day and night, worshiping, praying, fasting like it's going to happen tomorrow? No, so as we look through this passage, there are a few things that I need to be reminded of about God's promises. The first thing is that God will answer in his divine timing. His divine timing. Both Simeon and Anna spent their entire lives waiting on the promise. And so just picture this for a minute, right? I can imagine that for Simeon, it might have been an ordinary day. Just a, an everyday, maybe, I don't know, a Thursday. It was just a Thursday morning. He's very well advanced in years. He was holding on to the promise that he'd see the consolation of Israel. And he maybe woke up day after day and thought, maybe today's the day. And no, nothing happened. And then the next day, maybe today's the day. And no, nothing happened. And imagine that over and over again. Day one, day two, day 50, day 6,038. Like day after day, that was his waking thought and then nothing happened. And then waking up the very next day to do the same thing. And then one day, out of the blue, maybe when he least expected it, bam, there he was. Jesus Christ in the flesh. The scripture says that the Holy Spirit was upon him as he approached Mary and Joseph and infant Jesus, he had probably dedicated thousands of babies by then. Thousands of babies by then. He had probably held thousands of babies as their parents dedicated them to the Lord. But I can imagine in the moment when he hears the internal voice of the Holy Spirit saying, this is it. This is that baby. You know, that, that split moment where all of that waiting all of that longing, all of that desire, it boils down to this one moment when God tells him, this is it. And I can imagine almost like his eyes like widening, like in that moment, he realizes what he's finally seeing. I can imagine his hands trembling as he reaches out to, you know, hold this four-month-old baby. I can imagine his heart pounding and his thoughts racing, you know, as it dawns on him that after years and maybe decades of waiting, this was the moment, this was God's divine timing. And all the waiting, all the hoping, all the praying, all the showing up day in and day out, all the giving up one moment and then signing back up again, all the disappointment and then believing for it again, all of that, all the pressing in and committing in his heart over and over again had been leading up to this divine moment of God's fulfilled promise. It had been just maybe another ordinary day for him. And he'd been there his whole life. He'd been doing what he's been doing his whole life. But this was God's divine moment that came out of nowhere. 
I can imagine that for Anna, it might have been an ordinary day as well. She had been there at the tem temple day and night, fasting, praying, worshiping for 64 years. You know, what, what do you sing after 64 years? You know? <laughs> what do you pray that hasn't been prayed already after 64 years? You know, there are, I did the math, there's 23,360 days in 64 years. So she did this for 23,360 days and nights. And I'm sure that out of those 23,360 days, there must have been days where she wondered, what in the world am I doing? She was widowed at 20. She could have easily gotten married. She could have easily built another family. She could have easily, you know, taken her future in a very different direction. I'm sure that there were days when she thought, what in the world am I doing? Why am I here day and night? Why am I fasting? Why am I praying? Why am I worshiping? I'm sure there were nights, you know, when she was there in the temple, and it was very quiet, and it was in the late hours, and she felt very alone, you know, in the place of prayer and worship. I'm sure that there were days when she wanted to, you know, you know what, forget this, you know? This is day, not maybe 23,000, maybe a long day, 985. You're like, okay, I think I've done my bit. You know, I think I've done my part. I think it's time to move on with my life. I'm sure that there were days when she wanted to give up and walk away. But the scripture says, and coming up at that very hour, at that exact moment, at the right day, the right hour, the right minute, when this impoverished couple just happens to come for this brief window of time to dedicate their four-month-old baby, Anna sees them from a distance, and maybe the, the voice of the Holy Spirit maybe speaks to her internally, and it says, this is him. This is it. This is who you've been waiting for for 64 years. And she rushes over. She recognizes who this is. She recognizes the promise she's been praying for and waiting for for 64 years. And she immediately gives glory to God, telling the people of God's faithfulness to his promises. Now, they were able to see God's promises fulfilled because they were there waiting for God's timing. And it's not just they were waiting for God's divine timing, but they were also there at the right place, and the right place was in God's presence. So the second thing that we can learn from Simeon and Anna is that God will end in the divine place. Both Simeon and Anna were found in God's temple seeking his presence. Now there's, I need us to pause here because there's something very profound about them being in the temple when Jesus appears to them when their prayers for decades upon decades is answer. As you wait for God, seek his presence. As you wait for his perfect timing, you draw close, you draw near. As you wait for his divine timing, you seek his divine presence. Because Simeon and Anna could have waited anywhere. They could have waited anywhere. They could have been at home. They're like, all right, well, I guess it's not time yet. I'm just going to Netflix, <laughs> until, you know, Jesus comes. They could have been out there living their best life now. They could have been anywhere in Israel doing anything at all, but they chose in the waiting to seek the Lord day after day. One year, two years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 60 years, they sought the Lord season after season through moments of discouragement, through seasons of futility, through seasons of, did I even hear from God? Maybe I'm just crazy, Right? They awaited the promise in his presence. Now, has it ever happened to you? It maybe hasn't happened to you, but it definitely has happened to me. Has it ever happened to you that in the waiting, you become a little bit resentful towards God? Like a little pizza, right? You get a little like, yeah, you're going to make me wait? Fine. You know, fine. In that case, I'm, I'm not going to worship. In that case, like, yeah. I, mean, I don't need this. You know, you get a little bit like, like, <laughs> like you feel like a chump, right? <laughs> you feel like, man, I'm, I'm better than this, right? And you start putting a little bit of distance between you and him. It's almost like a very passive aggressive kind of move, right? Like you don't want to like feel like you really want it. You don't want to set yourself up for, you know, for disappointment. So you're kind of like playing it cool a little bit. You're like, all right, well, if it's not your timing then. I'll just back off a little bit, a little bit of distance here. It won't harm anything, you know. I'm going to save myself a little bit of the heartache. 
I'm gonna save myself a little bit of my dignity. I'm gonna create a little bit of distance. So God, you know that we're not in great terms, you know, like just so you know, I'm gonna withhold my worship. I'm gonna, you know, withhold my prayers. I'm, I'm you know, I'm gonna show you that, you know, I'm, I'm a little disappointed. And sometimes we do that with God when we're in the waiting. But Simeon and Anna did the exact opposite. And this is a part that it's hard for me to understand. They said, oh, you're going to make me wait? Okay. As I wait, this is not going to be wasted time. I'm going to seek you in your presence. I'm going to pray. I'm going to fast. I'm going to worship. I'm going to believe for it. I'm going to contend for it. I'm going to tell people about it. You're going to see me here day in and day out. I'm not going anywhere. That was the kind of posture that they had. That was the place where they waited for the promise of God. It wasn't just this like, all right, God, you take your time. I'm just here waiting. I'm just here waiting. Just whenever, whenever you're good, whenever you're ready. They didn't do that. Day after day, they sought the Lord. How incredible is that to do that for 64 years? I, I don't have a category for that in my brain. So as they waited, day in and day out, their hearts fully open. Yes, they're setting themselves up for disappointment. Yes, it's scary at times. Yes, they must have felt lonely at times. Sure, all of those things. But as they waited, it was almost like the promise came and found them. Does that make sense? When the divine timing came, the exact time, the exact date, the exact minute, God knew where to find them. Did you know it's over five miles from Bethlehem to Jerusalem? And so when you're walking, it's about 5.58 miles by foot. And the temple itself is enormous. The temple mount, so like the court on which the temple is, is kind of like sitting on, it, just the length itself, it's 4.5 football fields long. It is huge. It's not this puny little building. Like, like here, if somebody walks in, you'll know who walks in, right? But we're talking about an enormous complex, an enormous building. The Temple Mount is divided into courts, and then the temple is within the, the inner court. It's a huge building full of hundreds, if not thousands of people who would come on a daily basis to give their offerings to God. You would hear the sound of worship. You would see the smoke of the sacrifices. You would hear the noise from the animals that were about to be slaughtered. You'd hear the prayers, the bustle. And even within that chaos, it was almost like, you know, like a honing missile. Like, it's like the promise just came, like, and just found Simeon and Anna. In the midst of all of that craziness, it's like Mary and Joseph walked 5.5 miles from Bethlehem to Jerusalem. They came through the gates, they crossed the courts of the Gentiles, and they bring Jesus to the exact person that had been waiting for him all these years. It's, it's that amazing. It's that wonderful. So can I give you an encouragement if you're waiting for God's promises over your life, if you're waiting for God to answer, you know, things regarding your calling, regarding your family, regarding your health, you're waiting for something bigger than yourself, this is my encouragement to you. Seek the Lord in the meantime. Seek the Lord. Draw near to him. Worship him. Pray to him. Make it your life to seek his presence. And whatever blessing is in store for you, whatever promise is in store for you, whatever inheritance is in store for you, it will come and find you at the right time because you're in the right place and that is seeking the Lord. Lastly, God will not only answer in his divine timing and in his divine place, but also in a divine way. God will answer in his own divine way. Both Simeon and Anna didn't know how God will fulfill the promise, but they recognized the fulfillment in an infant. It would have been so easy for Simeon and Anna to miss it completely. They could have been at the right time, in the right place, and see it right under their nose, and they could have still completely missed it. Jesus was just a four-month-old. 
And this we know because the text says he was circumcised after eight days, right? He was born, and he's eight days old, he was circumcised. And then there's a period where, where the mother is, you know, uh, deemed to be unclean after giving birth, and that's four months when it's a male child. So four months. And then after that period, they need to come into the temple to be purified. And so Jesus was probably around four months and eight days old at this point. They came to the temple for purification rite and to dedicate their firstborn male. This was a daily occurrence to Simeon and Anna. Daily, by the hundreds, if not thousands, on a daily basis. When families came to get richly purified, when they would dedicate their babies to the Lord, this was... Can you imagine, like, you know here in Korea, when you give birth, like, you have to register your kid, right? You should register your kid, right? And imagine there's only one Tong Samusa, like, for the entire nation. It's kind of like that. There's only one temple. This is the one place where everybody and their mama brings their kid, you know, to get, you know, uh, to be dedicated unto the Lord. And so this is one temple, and every good Jew from this entire region, no matter how far, they would come to give their offerings. So we're talking about thousands and thousands of babies that would come through the temple courts on a daily basis. We also know that Mary and Joseph were an unassuming looking, looking couple, very ordinary looking, and they were actually fairly impoverished. And this we know because in Leviticus 12, it says the appropriate sacrifice, you know, when you're dedicating your baby is a, a lamb. You have to give a lamb. But... If you are too poor, then you can offer up two young pigeons instead. And that's what they were doing. And so they were not in a place where they could even offer a baby lamb, and they had to offer two pigeons instead. So that's what we see happening here. These, these are not impressive look, like an impressive looking couple rolling into the temple and everything about them screams, I am holding the Messiah who's going to you know, die for the sins of the world. Nothing about them screams any of that. They were very ordinary looking, maybe even lower than ordinary. There was, they were just one family in a sea of faces of people who had come and gone day in and day out in the temple courts. But Simeon and Anna were able to discern that this was a promise out of thousands of children they had seen, out of thousands of families that they had probably hosted you know, in the temple courts. They knew that this was the one. And to me, this is what it tells me. Number one, both Simeon and Anna were so attuned to the voice of the Holy Spirit that when this very ordinary-looking family came, probably one out of thousands, they were able to supernaturally discern that this was no ordinary family, that this was no ordinary child. This is the epitome of don't judge a book by its cover kind of thing, right? This was the promise that the prophets of old has, had been speaking about for thousands of years, and they were able to pinpoint that simply because they were so attuned to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Now, second thing that this tells me is that they had probably laid down their own personal expectations of what it would look like when God answered the prayer. They probably had to surrender. Well, this is how God ought to answer this promise. This is how God should show up in our lives they had probably surrendered these things to him, and they were probably in a posture, in a place where they said, God, your ways are higher. Your ways are better. I will trust you in this. I don't fully understand. I don't fully see it, but I will trust that your way is better. Now, I want to live like that. I know I'm often not like that. Like, I want God to answer A, B, and C, and then there's like stipulations, and then like sub points, and I want God to answer a very particular way. But I want to live like Simeon and Anna. They were open-handed. They were expectant, but they were surrendered. They were trusting in his timing. They were trusting that his ways are higher, his thoughts are higher. They did not withhold themselves from him, but they sought him day after day. They sought him in the waiting. They sought him through the disappointment and the setbacks. That's how I want to live my own life, too. I want to be able to wait in this way. So what do we do? What does the Bible say we ought to do? We wait upon the Lord. We wait upon his timing. We wait in the right place of intimacy with him. We wait him for him to answer in his way, not ours, on his terms, and not ours. 
and we wait not in a passive, kind of distant or impatient, you know, like, you know, like something better happen, you know, after all this waiting kind of way, but in a way that is open-handed and open-hearted, a way that is surrendered unto him. You wait upon the Lord with courage. You wait upon the Lord when it's hard to hold on. When you are ready to give up and you're ready to give in, when it's the second time, it's the tenth time, it's the 23rd thousand and 360th time, that's how you wait upon the Lord. And here's the beauty of it. Yes, it will require courage. Yes, it will require resilience and stamina and grit and faith and believing it over and over and over again. But there's also going to be grace. There's going to be joy in the waiting. There's going to be people that gather around you to hold up your arms when you can't hold them up on your own. There's going to be a fresh infusion of hope as you seek the Lord when you feel like you're about to give up. There's going to be a fresh call to surrender when you start getting close-fisted and you start striving in the flesh and you begin to lean upon your own good works. God will meet you there in the waiting. You know, Psalm 27, 14, it says, Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Psalm 37 says, be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. Psalm 38, it says, but for you, O Lord, do I wait. It is you, O Lord, my God, who will answer. Isaiah 40, it says, he gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men Young men shall fall exhausted, but they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Isaiah 64 says, From of old no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God besides you who acts for those who wait for him. Romans 8, it says, For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, but for who, hopes for, what, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Micah 7 says, But as for me, I will watch expectantly for the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Psalm 130, My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning. Indeed, more than the watchman for the morning. James 5, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and late rains. Hebrews 6, and so having patiently waited, Abraham obtained the promise. Psalm 37, for evildoers will be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land. Hebrews 10, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. We wait upon the Lord. We wait upon his promise. We wait for his coming. We wait for his timing. We wait for him. You now, Advent is a season of hope. Christmas is a season of hope, whether you are Christian or not. And it's not because of Santa. It's not because of the gifts. It's not because of Christmas tradition and twinkling lights and, you know, hot chocolate by a fireplace. It's not because of any of these things, but it's a season of hope because in God's divine timing, and in God's divine way, the promise of salvation of the world came to us when we were least expecting it, in the form in which we were least expecting, as a baby in a manger that was dedicated at a temple, a baby that one day would bear the weight of the sins of the world upon his shoulders. This is why Christmas season and Advent season is a season of hope because all the waiting does not lead us astray, does not lead us nowhere. It leads us to Christ. And so as I ask the praise team to come up, I want to end with this. You know, a long, long time ago, I came to the Lord. I, I can't even do the math, and yes, I'm very old by now. Um, it was when I was probably around fourth or fifth grade. And by then, I had already been going to church for a few years. And it was just an ordinary year, an ordinary 
you know, weekend, we were actually having a retreat on that Sunday and had already heard the gospel message multiple times. I'd already, you know, talked to different people about it. I already had memorized scriptures. I had already, I knew certain songs. You know, I grew up in a, in a Korean, Korean church, like a, a first generation Korean church in Chile. Um, that's very weird and random, but I can phonetically, just phonetically, like recite certain things to you in Korean. And I actually don't know what it means, kind of. Like, for example, I can recite like, I can do that. As long as you don't stop me in the middle, I can recite the whole thing. <laughs> it's just phonetically, you know, right? I knew all these things, and I've been going to church already for years. I had friends at church. People knew who I was. I was serving in different teams. And it was just this ordinary year and out of nowhere. And I had already listened to the gospel message multiple times. I already knew the deaconesses who were teaching us and who were in charge of youth group and nothing about it was special but I remember that at this one retreat we had this moment where all all us kids we sat around on, on a you know in a circle and then these deaconesses they came out with these tubs of water and they knelt at our feet and washed our feet we were like fourth grade we we're like little kids and I don't know about you guys but but I was born in a Korean Korean church you don't do that like elders you're like Anyaze, like push the like like 90 degrees Anyaze, you know you don't you you would never expect an older person to kneel at your feet and wash your feet when you were just a kid and I remember just looking down and I knew the gospel message I had memorized you know these different verses and I knew the songs and I knew all these things but something about that moment was just God's timing say it any other way and the gospel message hit me for first time in my life I knew the things in my mind but it never really struck my heart until that moment and it was like it cut to the heart and I remember I was sitting there very awkwardly I was very uncomfortable like what is going on here why is this adult kneeling at my feet washing my feet and weeping over me and I remember like the mental calcul like it just did not compute in my because in, in my mind, adults don't do that. They don't humble themselves in that way and like put down their dignity in that way to kneel in front of a kid and wash their feet and weep over them in their salvation. And I remember this passing thought just crossed my mind. And it was, man, if I feel this way about this chipsanim, this, this deaconess, how would I feel if it was the God of the universe kneeling at my feet and cleansing me from my uncleanliness? And I think that was the moment. I'd heard the gospel so many times. I'd been to all these programs Sunday after Sunday. It didn't matter. Like all those things were seeds that were sown in into my life. But it was God's divine timing where for the first time the gospel really pierced my heart. And I can say that that was a moment where was saved and it was years into me attending church this was God's mercy this was God's grace over my life where it was just an ordinary day it was a run-of-the-mill retreat we had done this multiple times before and maybe I've, maybe I'd heard the same messages before as well the same presentation of the gospel before but something about that day and God's just divine timing he chose that moment to really have the gospel pierce through my heart for the first time. So this is my encouragement to us today. How often do we think, man, today's just going to be another Sunday. Today's just going to be another day. Nothing really different about today. What if God wants to break in into our lives in a fresh new way, in a way that we never even anticipated, and all it takes is waiting? All it takes is you don't need to force it. You don't need to like, ah, oh, I want this to be my divine moment. Oh, yes, I want the gospel to penetrate into my heart. That's that's not what it was. It was just surrender and waiting and trusting. And if it's real, man, God will have it come to pass. God, God will have his way in my life. I just simply want to be open-hearted, waiting, seeking him in the meantime for his divine timing.